Okay, so part three is the founding of St. Augustine. Um, this is, of course, the Spanish name for St. Augustine. Um, as part of module two, conquest and colonization. So we've already talked about the background behind um, why Philip pushes for the Spanish conquest. Um, how does Spain hope to lay claim, to claim, lay claim to the territory? Obviously, using Spanish names um, and using maps, um, but also establishing a presidio at St. Augustine. And the presidios are basically forts. Um, keep in mind that Castillo is not going to be built for, you know, quite a while yet. So everything is built with wood, um, which there was plenty of um, in northern Florida. But um, so his main interest or what he's trying to do here is he's trying to um, provide aid to shipwreck victims. And it, it, before you say, well, that's really nice of them. Think of it this way, is that each of those ships, you know, would cost millions of dollars, maybe even billions today. So it's not really the protection of the victims of the shipwreck. It's finding out where the shipwreck is so that they can pull the precious metal off of it. Um, he could really care less about the victims themselves, but they provide information that will help them recover the gold or the silver. So what explains the desire to conquer new territory for Spain? Obviously land, um, riches, gold, precious metals, um, lordship, the fact that they are trying to connect the native population in some sort of hierarchical fashion to Spanish crown. Um, so there's this big kind of leadership um, pyramid that develops. Um, urbanization, um, this is an interesting idea. Spain always focused um, efforts for colonization on having settlements or cities where um, people would live, but they had to live there. They had to come in, one, for mass, but also to be educated. And they felt that um, civilization took place within the cities, that, you know, people who were attracted to, to being colonists or settlers in Florida were kind of the wild type. And so they felt like this could be something that um, would help them settle into um, and be productive citizens of the Spanish Empire. Um, and this is something, obviously, they learned from the Reconquista. So Pedro Mendez um, comes about through a number of different um, ways to being a sailor. He's, he's drawn to the sea. Um, he's in the province of Asturias, which um, we talked about in the previous um, mo uh, part part two um, about Spain. It's very um, focused on sea trade. Um, and slowly, Menendez gains favor with the crown. Um, he accompanies Philip on his trip to England to marry Queen Mary, um, the daughter of Henry VIII. Um, obviously, he would have had um, a place in the court with the king. Um, he's named Captain General of the Armada de la Carrera. Um, and in March 20th, on March 20th, 1565, he's given this asiento, this um, title or this contract from King Philip to take control of Florida and ultimately remove the threat of the French settlers. And what the Asiento basically does is it outlines what Menendez has to do in order to gain this title of land. Um, he is given the title to Florida. Um, and remember, Florida is not just the peninsula. This is North America. So this is a pretty big step for Menendez. Um, some of the requirements that Philip has within this contract um, is that uh, Menendez has to build two to three Spanish towns with at least 100 residents each. That's a lot of people. He had to recruit farmers, laborers, sailors, and soldiers on his own. And he had to provide out of his own pocket enough livestock for the, for the colony's needs. Um, naturally, Menendez takes this um, offer um, and goes with it. But he already sees a number of issues that are going to take place. 
So the first real settlement, of course, is Santa Elena, which sits on Paris Island, which also sits on the site of Charles Fort. So he comes in and he takes control of this site. He basically gets rid of the French um, from Charles from Charles Fort. But keep in mind, he also has to deal with Fort Caroline. Um, Santa Elena serves as a base for the Jesuit missionaries. Um, Pedro Mendez calls on the Jesuits to be the first missionaries to tend to the Indians of North America. Um, and there's a reason why. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, eventually, Santa Elena is abandoned in 1587, um, and the people are moved to St. Augustine. In 1565, you have the creation of St. Saint, Saint Augustine or St. Augustine. Now, the reason why he picks St. Augustine is its proximity to Fort Caroline, because it's very easy to get to Fort Caroline from there. St. Augustine also has a very well-protected fort, naturally. It's not one that he protects, necessarily, but it's very difficult to cross the bar, which is um, basically moving from the ocean into the inlet, um, and it becomes a problem for St. Augustine throughout its history, and we'll talk more about that, especially around the British period. Um, but you have to wait for high tide um, in order to cross the bar into the inlet, um, because most of the ships can't get through um, on their own without um, the extra water that's coming from high tide. Two main reasons for the creation of the city, protecting the shipment and a base for shipwreck victims, but the third unspoken kind of focus for the city is getting rid of the French. The original fort um, was, is pictured below, and that was a council house of the Indians that lived in St. Augustine, um, who were part of the Tamuqua. Um, and basically the Tamuqua chief welcomes the Spanish and says, here, here's our council house, you're welcome to stay here. This was a traditional method um, for Indians. Um, the council house was seen as um, kind of the place where you would put up visitors to the city or um, to the to the village. Um, and so the Spanish kind of misinterpret that a little bit, or maybe they didn't, maybe they intentionally did it, but they end up digging a moat around the council house and putting up a wall um, and basically taking control of it. The city of St. Augustine itself changes a number of times. It switches from the mainland, it goes over to Anastasia Island um, at one point, um, and then it returns back um, to the settlement that we recognize today. This is a wooden fort that's later built um, in the, on the site of the Castillo. Um, and they have a number, I think four or five different forts um, that are built, but of course they're made of wood um, with the moisture and the soil being so um, moist, there's, there's a lot of, of wood rot. And so the forts um, don't have a lot of stain, sustainability and so they're replaced quite often. This is a map showing the fortifications of St. Augustine. Um, obviously you've got the fort over here. There's an Indian town here. Wow, that's not really working well. Let's see if I can use a marker. Okay, that's not much better. Anyway, um, and then you can see the outline of the city um, and the fortifications. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. But there is an Indian village on the southern end of the island, um, as, or I'm sorry, on the, on the mainland as well. So you've got this central location um, that is the actual town. Um, this, of course, is a later drawing because um, the fort is there, but there would have been a wooden fort there um, as well. The other thing to notice is the roads. Um, the Indians always had roads moving through the through through the wilderness or through the um, the woods and stuff. These roads would have been um, used by the Spanish as well. So um, when we start talking about roads that run between St. Augustine and Pensacola later on, the El Camino Real, it would have fallen or followed um, Indian trails. So 
Florida and the Americas, we've kind of talked about this already. Um, Ponce de Leon comes in 1513, 1565. You have the founding of St. Augustine. Um, you have the founding of Santa Elena. Um, Santa Elena ends up getting abandoned. Um, in 1586, there's this basically a trial or tribunal by the Council of the Indies. And basically they say, why are we keeping the colony? What's the purpose of this colony? Um, and these are all the arguments that they, they stuck to. Um, the lack of precious metals, gold and silver, there's nothing there. So there doesn't seem to be any purpose from a substantial economic perspective. Um, they did believe that there were trade routes to New Spain. They believed that Mexico was much closer to Florida than it actually was. Um, Florida had a limited native population. And one of the things that this is a direct result of is the fact that they weren't able to use the encomendia system that they used in New Spain, Mexico, and in Southern, um, in South America because you just didn't have the population um, in order to do that. Plus, they really needed um, the native population support um, because Spain never really funds this colony, Florida's colonies, um, in a really big manner. It's always um, kind of conquest on the budget, so to speak. Um, protection to the fleet coming out of New Spain, this was a, a benefit that they saw that was needed, um, again, to protect the fleet, but also to protect the shipments. So if you had um, shipwreck victims, they wanted to find them quickly so that they could identify where the gold was. So early St. Augustine, the picture on the left is a drawing, um, kind of shows that there's a dock, um, there's a church, there are buildings, um, wooden buildings, probably with thatched roofs. Um, you have fires that break out throughout the city um, that also play a role in all of um, the destruction of the city, but um, you don't have any real permanent architecture, um, substantial architecture yet. I mean, kind of talking about this impermanent architecture, these are examples of different uh, materials that were used by the Spanish. Um, again, they're not using, they're, they don't have substantial um, architecture until they begin to use tabby and stone. Um, so everything is pretty much built with wood um, and plaster. The bottom left is this construction material called wattle and daub, which is basically weaving um, strands of wood um, or vine, and then you put this kind of plaster material over it um, for insulation. Um, and that was what was very common to be used within early St. Augustine. Tabby is used later, um, but there are several homes that uh, have been re restored or recreated using this method. Um, but remember that tabby is a local um, construction material, but it's brought by African slaves from Africa. Africa um, was using tabby um, prior to European contact, um, and the Europeans import that uh, material to the South. And obviously they're using shell um, within this mixture. Um, some other buildings as well, these of course are much later. Um, because they are more permanent architecture, um, but it does show the different styles that are in use. Um, you can see um, on the left the chart um, that you had mostly one-story buildings um, prior to 1700, um, inside shutters, which uh, obviously they didn't have glass, so they had to have some sort of protection um, and privacy, and so shutters would have been used at that point. Roofs, um, again, chart kind of shows you um, most of it is thatch. Um, you don't really have anything solid until um, much later, but there's the roof thatching. So most of the buildings, the municipal buildings, churches, all of that stuff would have been um, 
by that. You would have had a brazier, which would have been a um, like a, a heating source um, that would have been used um, during the winter. And also you would have Spanish kitchens, which were outdoor kitchens. Um, they reduced the threat of fire, um, which was always an issue. Um, but women were used to cooking outdoors. Um, they could hang their herbs and stuff from the ceiling, from the rafters, um, and it also provided for ventilation. So one of the issues that St. Augustine reflects, or the archaeologists have found, um, Kathy Deegan is one of the, probably the preeminent archaeologists for St. Augustine, um, and she's produced a number of different articles, and you read hopefully one of those articles um, prior to launching into this um, particular part, but if you haven't, please read it, because it does provide a great deal of evidence uh, to support what we're talking about. But this issue is the, the issue of race. Um, Sistema de Castas is a system of caste, um, which means the caste system is built off of race. This begins during the Reconquista. Um, once you have the converts of, Jew, of um, Muslims and Jews who are switching to um, Catholicism, um, many Catholics believed that these recent converts, which were called conversos, were doing so to save their skin or to make money or to be able to stay in Spain. And so there was this distrust among the people um, with these people or with these, these recent converts. Um, and so they would refer to them in these negative and derogatory names. Um, Muslims were called moriscos, which were Moors. Moors were usually from Africa, they were black. So if you ever hear anybody referred to as um, a Moor, um, typically that meant that they were African uh, or of African descent. Um, Jews were called Moranos, which um, means pig. Um, obviously Jews don't eat pork, um, so this is a derogatory term. But from these kind of this system or this, this kind of um, understanding or distrust of converts, they create this system um, where they rank people based off on race and really on skin color. Um, so the picture on the left is one of these Costas paintings, um, and it ranks like the first place or the first, the, the best group to be in were called um, Peninsulares or um, Spanish, Espanol. Um, if you had a Spanish father and a Spanish mother, then you were in the top group. Um, but as you find with colonization, and especially with St. Augustine, you don't have a great deal of women um, coming with these men, especially in the early days. So Spanish soldiers that were stationed in St. Augustine um, typically would intermarry or interbreed with the local population. And so if you were an Espanol who married or had a child with a native, um, that would push your offspring into a lower rank um, on the system, Sistema de Costas. Um, and how does this interact um, with colonization? Well, if you were hoping to get a position within the colonial government, you had to go to the church who kept your records of your birth and your christening and all of that stuff and marriage, and you would get a um, cedula de gracias al sacar, which means basically a certificate um, of blood. Basically, it was your lineage. And so they would place you on a certain level within this system. Um, and if you were hoping to get a very high ministerial position, um, those were reserved for the peninsulares. So you had to prove that you were of both Spanish mother and father in order to get that position. Um, if you were hoping for a lower government position, you may be able to, to get it if your family was, um, if your mother was a native and your father was Spanish. Um, and so there are all these different levels to this. And what's important is it shows a relationship with race that predates um, British racial systems. Because if, if we look at the slave trade, 
um, within Spain, there's a great deal more leniency and moderation than there is within the British slave system. And that's important when we talk about um, slavery within Florida um, at a later point. But anyway, so purity of blood, it's not a fixed outcome. This does not mean that if you are a um, criollo, a, a creole, that you can't, your family can't move up. So you're, you know, you may marry um, as a criollo, a, a creole, um, you may marry a Spanish woman. And as a result, your child will move up on this scale because you, you know, your wife is higher than you are or vice versa. Um, so it's very important to understand um, this issue of race. So a Spanish and a mestizo, a mestizo, so produces a castizo. So these are images where a Spaniard marries a um, mestizo woman, um, and so their child is now on a lower level. Um, castizo were usually 75% Spanish, European, um, and 25% native. Uh, Mestizo was um, Spanish and Native American descent. Um, and the thing to look at in these pictures um, are, is the background and their dress, because it changes. Um, these Costas painters were very much concerned about the economic status of these people in representing them. So when you take a look at um, the Spaniard and an albino um, woman um, produces a torn up Torna Atras, um, these are shopkeepers. These are people who are probably middle class. Um, com you know, and look at how Peninsulare is, um, look, look at how Peninsulare is depicted. So a Torna, torna Atras means turned black, meaning the child looks black even though the parents don't. Um, obviously the mother is albino, um, the father is a Spaniard. Um, this is a coyote, um, which, you know, obviously it looks like American coyote, coyote. Um, you'll notice that the lower levels often are um, suggestive of animal terms, um, which shows a lack of status. Again, look at the background, look at the images um, within the painting and the fruit. Obviously, these are farmers, these are poorer people not shopkeepers, and certainly not your elite. Castizo and Mestizo woman produces a chamizo, which is um, means thatched hut. So again, very poor. Um, these are shopkeepers, most likely. Uh, mestizo and an Indian produce a coyote. So again, you have the depictions of um, economic status and clothing. But the thing to remember about this system is that it is fluid. It is not set in stone. In other words, your family does not fall into one area. Um, think about it this way in terms of India. Um, if you fell into the Brahmin class, you were always part of the Brahmin class. Your family would always socialize, intermarry, and um, your world was with other Brahmins. You did not intermix. You did not um, interact with other castes, um, except in terms of business. But in terms of blood and family lines, you stayed within your own class. And that's what's really different about this. Um, also, the fact that Spaniards are dealing with the issue of race in a much earlier format. Um, it may not be the best system. I don't necessarily agree with it, but it does show that they are trying to come up with some way to deal with this issue. Um, and so it does seem to suggest um, that from an earlier period, Spaniards and Portuguese are um, have interactions with different races in comparison to their British counterparts. So how does this evidence itself within St. Augustine? Well, if you look at the top picture, um, this is the location of Costa households in 1763. So we're dealing with a later period, but it does show the importance of caste or class. Um, you'll notice that the houses are in periphery areas. They're away from 
the main portion of town. Um, if you look at the bottom, merchant and official households, they are in the area right around the plaza. And this is where all of the government buildings were located. The cathedral would have been here, um, the market. So most of the important buildings are around the plaza area, um, not outside of that. And so the fort is in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, but the most of these elite within St. Augustine are located around the plaza. So this, in many ways, and, and Deegan talks about this um, in some of her research, indicates that social standing was very much important in the colonial system um, because it could impact you know, ethnic affiliation, your occupation, as well as your income. Um, we can't leave St. Augustine without talking about um, Nuestra de la Señora de Soledad. Um, this is the church that was built um, on St. George Street. Um, it is um, located in the older section of town. If you're familiar with St. Augustine, you know that um, the south of the plaza is the older part of the city. And this is where this church would have been located. Um, the graveyard would have been up near the bayfront. So this is an image looking down um, an alleyway between A1A Alehouse, the building that A1A Alehouse um, occupies is right there on the front of the bayfront. Um, and then one of the recreated buildings um, so it's just to, if you're looking at Avalay Street, it's to the left. Um, but there are just as many um, historical places, there are graves all over St. Augustine and they have discovered more graves. Um, most recently, they've discovered another graveyard um, which was tied to this church. Um, so why is that important? Well, you find a lot of um, this caste and class system um, within the graveyards themselves. So around where the church stood, you would have had um, the elite buried together and the poorer classes would have been buried further away from the church. Um, in some cases you have burials within the church, um, but most of them were within graveyards or in the area. And that may be Kathy Deegan right there, but that's Carl Halbert, um, who was the city archeologist um, for St. Augustine on the far left. So um, that brings us to our um, article, Mestiza in St. Augustine. So why did the Spanish have such an elaborate system of classification of race? Well, it shows a um, in-depth interaction with different class, different races. Um, what does that mean in terms of colonial system? Well, what Deegan argues is that um, Early St. Augustine lacked a number of women. Um, and so when they, when these soldiers are housed within St. Augustine or in, in are settling in St. Augustine in these settlers, um, most of them take native wives. And our interpretation of this is that, well, naturally they're gonna fall into um, Spanish um, culture and they're going to become part of that culture. But what we find is actually quite the opposite that, um, this idea of going native that we tend to think of with Europeans um, and frowning upon this practice um, actually was welcomed in St. Augustine because um, the pottery, evidence that we see of the pottery, um, the food diets um, of the settlers, the early settlers who have married, in, married native peoples um, indicates that there was kind of a hybridization or um, consolidation of native and Spanish culture into one. Um, and this is kind of a unique um, discovery because our tendency is always that European culture will rule out. Um, naturally, you know, Spanish men would have preferred to hold on to their culture and they, they saw their culture as being more superior than the native population. But you're now finding yourselves you know, a thousand miles away from Spain um, and needing survival. And so you're gonna obviously rely on um, 
food stuff and cuisine of the native population for survival. I mean, you have to. Um, and I think that's what Deegan kind of points to. So it's an interesting article, um, but the idea is that the Castas um, does not preclude men from marrying beneath them. Um, and that's one of the, the ideas is that this system was very fluid, um, especially when they need a woman to take care of the house, they need a woman to cook, they need a woman to do all these domestic chores. Um, and so their marriages were done um, within the church. They were married um, in terms of Spanish um, custom, Catholics, um, they would have been baptized into the church and then they would have been eligible to marry. And in many cases, these men did marry, but they didn't completely abandon their native culture and cuisine. So conquest by contract, this is what um, the Indian relations um, within St. Augustine in Florida are known from. There is a thing called the situado, S-I-T-U-A-D-O, which was basically the money that was given by the crown to the colony um, in St. Augustine, the governor in St. Augustine. Um, and it was used for a number of things. One, it was used for payroll. So if you were a soldier, you were paid out of the situado. If you were a friar and you were running a Spanish mission, you were paid out of the situado. It was all the money that the crown used um, to fund the colony. So a portion of the situado was used um, for gift giving. And there was a whole ceremony where the governor would welcome the Indian chiefs into the city. Um, and essentially there was this kind of um, contract, and we'll talk about that in just a second, um, where the chief would pledge his support to the governor as the kind of embodiment of the, of the crown, and the governor would in turn pledge his support to the, to the chief, and how he would communicate that is by giving him a bunch of goods. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a second. So these treaties with chiefs, they would come in, they would meet with the governor, uh, they provide three main purposes. One, evidence of peaceful relations with the natives. Um, they obligated the chief um, number two is they obligated the chief to provide support when needed, which meant labor as well as military support. Um, and they provided evidence of claims to land and territory to foreign powers. So if the British were trying to encroach, um, the Spanish could say, you know what, we have this treaty with, you know, Indians in this territory. Um, and so they're under the support of Spain. And so therefore you don't have a legitimate claim to this territory. Um, were these treaty, treaties treated as equal agreements between equal parties? Um, and many argue, many historians say no, that this has feudal undertones, that the governor was seen as the lord and the chief was seen as the vassal. So it's this contract, but it is not um, of two equal parties, and it never will be in the United States uh, between natives and people of European descent. So the treaties provide a number of things, promises of mutual defense, um, produce a Spanish sphere of influence. This goes back to um, what they can produce as evidence of um, having control within a certain territory to foreign powers. Um, it promises obedience to the king. Um, it gives new territories um, in terms of the the crown, so the crown can say, well, we didn't have to send men in, but we have this agreement with the natives of the Appalachian territory, and so therefore it falls into the realm of the crown. Um, and the most important thing is that these documents, these contracts promise that the chiefs will welcome missionaries, that their people will undergo indoctrination, and that they will become part of the mission. And this was a very important element within these treaties, because once you were at peace with the Spanish, it meant that you welcomed their missionaries and um, friars into your village. The treaties were sealed with a ceremony where the chief kissed the hand of the governor, and then the chief received goods 
um, in exchange. And this was an annual thing that took place in St. Augustine. So once a year, all these chiefs made their travel or um, brought an entourage into St. Augustine to meet with the governor. So um, what happened with chiefs when they broke this? Well, or wrote these contracts. What would happen is essentially um, the American version of excommunication, that the chief could be removed, he, could, he would lose all privileges, and he would be sent into exile. Um, in order to be restored to control um, and to gain all of these things back, he would have to come before the governor and basically have this kind of ritual humiliation that had to be witnessed by notaries and, and, um, and documented. Um, all of these treaties, by the way, had a notary who would write down everything that was um, agreed upon and then they would sign it, the parties would sign it, and then this notary would stamp it. And then that agreement was sent to Spain to be held in the Spanish archives. And we have um, many of these agreements um, thankfully within the Spanish archives um, in Seville. Um, followers of the chief, people who sided with the chief over the Spanish <coughs> would face similar um, punishments. They would lose their status as Christians and they could be subject to forced labor. Not that the native population wasn't um, put into forced labor, but um, it kind of gave, it put them to the front of the list, so to speak. Um, Chief-led rebellions are rare in Florida. Um, what's more common um, is that the people rebel and remove their chief. Um, if the chief is siding with the Spanish and the people see the Spanish as um, acting badly, then um, they would just remove the chief altogether. Um, you have some tribes who stay outside of the Spanish um, system. These are people who reject Christianity and do not welcome the missions into their system. Um, gradually, Spain makes inroads with these, but they never do fully accept the mission system. So there is later on the potential for native populations um, to reject the mission system and still have some sort of trade relationship with um, the Spanish. Um, 1573, Menendez is frustrated. He's trying to bring about reconciliation with native populations, um, and he decides to deal with this in a quick and easy way by selling rebellious natives into slavery. Um, not a good idea and certainly not something that's going to sit well with many of the natives. Um, he dies in 1574 and leaves his daughters the title um, that he gains from his Asiento. Um, his, of course, this title doesn't go to directly to the daughters, it goes to their husbands. And so you have um, Pedro's son-in-law who comes to Santa Elena, he assumes the title, um, but it basically, he's not very good at leading um, the colony, natives rebel, um, and so he ends up leaving La Florida in failure. At that point, the crown then falls in back to um, crown control and it becomes a crown colony. So there is no more um, Adelanto or governor over Florida. Well, I say that there's no more leader over Florida. It goes back to the crown. So the crown is considered the leader of Florida. Hope that makes sense. So the crown um, takes control. Um, Philip II passes three laws um, that specifically address Spain's empire. Ordinances of pacification, 1573. This is where Philip tries to alleviate some of the problems from the Incomendia system where he outlaws abuses against the native population. And his justification for this is that we are trying to convert these people. Um, they are Christian, um, so therefore you are treating Christians badly. Um, and this was something that he did not agree with. 
Um, unfortunately for Philip, it doesn't really, the laws don't really do anything. Um, the system itself lasts um, and the abuses continue. Of course, in Florida, you don't have this concern um, because you don't have the income media system taking shape. Um, in 1574, he changes uh, procedures for filling church positions, um, trying to make them more qualified and less about patronage. Um, so you can't buy your way into a church office, but the crown still um, maintains control of who fills these positions. Um, but the one that is very important to St. Augustine into Florida is the laying out of the city, the ordinance of the laying out of the city in 1573. This is where he basically makes it a law that you need to have a plaza, you need to have a central gathering place. Um, and then the government buildings will be built around this plaza. And of course, that manifests itself in St. Augustine as the Plaza de la Constitucion, and that's still in existence today. Um, and so most of the important buildings were built around um, this plaza. So um, actually, this looks like a repeat slide. Cute. Um, so we're going to so the Presidio system, this outlines um, or, out, or shows you all the different settlements or forts um, within Spanish control. It shows you also that Spain stuck mostly to the coast, as it should. Um, you have a number of settlements within South Carolina, Georgia, all along the Florida coast, along the Atlantic and Gulf Coast. Um, okay. If you look at the numbers, and I don't have the dates on here, and I apologize for that, but most of the dates in this territory, I love how this marker is not working very well. Um, the one through nine are all built prior to 1570. So that's the Atlantic coast here. Um, and then you have the southern um, forts as well. Um, 10 through 15 are built later. So I'm going to change colors on this wonderful marker. These are built later. So what does that mean? What does that suggest? Well, what it will suggest or what we will see is that it means that the colony has a change in um, vision or focus. Um, basically what it means is that they're beginning to move into the Appalachian territory um, and there's a reason for that and we'll talk about that in a minute. So before we move on um, to the last uh, module or the last part of this module I do want to talk about real quick about the, the conflicts between church and state and I had mentioned um, that the situado is the money that comes from the crown um, that pays for everything about the colony. Well, the reason that there's a conflict between church and state is that both the missionaries and then both in the civil government, the governor as well as his leadership um, council are all paid out of the same fund. So let's say, for example, you have 500 soldiers. Um, those 500 soldiers are paid out of the situado. Now, if you are eager to protect your colony, um, as the governor, any good governor would be, um, if you have to share this budget with church officials like missionaries, and the focus of the church is to have, you know, 30 missions, and you're going to need, you know, roughly 150 guys to man all of those missions, that means you have to work out some sort of agreement with your with the state, um, with the governor, in terms of sharing the cost of that. Um, and so one of the arguments that happens um, is that the govern government says, you know what, we need two funds. We need to have a fund for soldiers and leaders and the civil government and protection that's se separate from the missionary fund. The missionary fund needs to be paid out of its own pocket. Spanish Crown basically says, no, I'm sorry, that's not going to happen. So they have this um, list called the do dotation, which is dotation. Um, I'm throwing a little French in there. 
um, which is basically the manpower report for colonial Spain. It outlines who's on the government payroll. So all of these friars, all of these soldiers, all these officials are all on that list. And it's capped at like 300 people, for example. So if you cap it at 300 and you've got 150 of those people are missionaries, that means you only have 150 people that you can either put into a government position or serve in the military. So that's going to limit the number of soldiers that you can have. So there's this feuding that goes on between um, the church and the state. Franciscan mission missionaries um, argue that the government uses the Indians for labor um, when really they shouldn't. Um, they're misusing the natives, and so therefore um, you don't need all these soldiers. Um, there should be more priests um, than soldiers. Um, so it, you know they get it gets kind of nasty um, back and forth. Um, so the Indians within the village would give a portion of their crop to their chief. Well, when the missions open up um, within the settlements, um, the missionary priest would in turn ask for a portion of the crops that would be given to them by each of the set, by each of the Indians. So they get like 10% of the total harvest. The chief gets 10% of the total harvest, that sort of thing. Um, and what the priests would do is they would sell that excess or that surplus um, and then use it to buy, um, you know, Bibles or statuary or crosses and stuff to decorate the church. Um, and this infuriates the civil leaders of the government um, because they're like, well, you know, they shouldn't be allowed to be able to exploit the natives this way. Of course, they're exploiting the natives for labor, so it's like, you know, pot calling kettle black. Okay. So as I mentioned before, um, goods are exchanged as part of this treaty process. Um, and this exchange is something that's very important um, for the native populations. So if you give someone something that's very valuable, then the Indians in return would give you something very valuable. And so the Spanish learned this very quickly that it's very important to give gifts that would have high value within the Indian population um, so that they could exploit them for labor. Um, it creates also this kind of reciprocal um, attitude that if the Spanish are giving you, you know, um, silks and fine clothing, then in return, they wanted something of high value um, and the natives would understand this language. Um, so slowly what begins to happen within the Spanish colony over time is that more and more goods are being exchanged with people outside of the chief. So it may be elites within the population that have goods to sell, and so they come to St. Augustine on their own accord, um, and they get these, you know, luxury items that they take back to the village. And so what this does within the hierarchy of the village is it weakens the position of the chief. Um, and so this becomes a complaint that many chiefs have with the Spanish government. Um, that's kind of one of the problems that, that emerges within this system. Um, okay. So anyway, you look at the list, it tells you basically what um, was part of the goods um, from the Royal Treasury. Flour, maize, um, hoes, kettles, blankets, shirts, hats, all these kind of things that are kind of interesting. In the last slide, um, I want to talk a little bit about self-identity. -identi um, many of the colonists that live in St. Augustine and within Florida begin to identify themselves by the term Floridanos. Um, and why is that important? Well, it, be it shows that they recognize themselves as something different than just Spanish within the empire system. And that's something that's very unique. Um, you have a melting pot of sorts. You have all these different people that begin to 
to reside within Florida um, and specifically within St. Augustine. One of the interesting aspects of this is that Spain begins to send convicts and prisoners to serve in the military. Um, and the reason they do this is because Florida is seen as kind of the frontier. It's if you're really, if you have any clout or any status within the colonial system, you're not going to go to Florida. You're going to try and go to Mexico because you can get wealthy. You can get a portion of this gold and silver that's coming out of Mexico. Um, Florida didn't have anything. So Florida was like, it's always a small number of people. Um, it's never exceeds like 100 or 200 people. Um, they're virtually on the edge of starvation at any point in time. Um, the situato that, that the crown gives them um, doesn't always come. Um, sometimes the ship sinks, sometimes they run aground or a hurricane, something else happens. Sometimes they just don't get the shipment of, of cash. And so they're operating on almost a cashless society until they get the cash in. Um, but the big change is that within Florida, you begin to see the rise of the caste dusted um, system as things begin to equal out. So as more men and women, as the balance between men and women equalizes, um, you have this kind of steps taken against the Indian population. Um, Indians have to have a pass to enter into St. Augustine itself. Um, and then at a certain time of the day, at night, Indians themselves are restricted from, from even being within the gates of the city. Um, Non-natives could only stay at most three days with an Indian village. And if they stayed within an Indian village, they had to stay in the council house. So you begin to see this kind of European superiority emerge after they've kind of taken advantage of the native population, which is, you know, kind of an obvious um, byproduct of all of this. So never think about um, St. Augustine as being um, a wealthy colony. It never is. As I said before, it's colonization or conquest on a budget. Um, you know, the city itself doesn't have permanent architecture until the Castillo was built, and then they gradually begin to use tabby um, in the 1700s. So up until the 1700s, it's a very, um, very much a frontier town. Um, but keep in mind that, that these Floridians begin to identify themselves as Floridians um, rather than just Spanish, because that does play a role later on when we talk about um, the end of the Spanish period.